this ain't your mama scene transition tutorial. In this video, we're going to create a scriptable object driven configurable approach to having dynamic scene transitions in your game. This will enable you to have a large variety of configurable transitions between your scenes. On top of that, we're going to do it with an asynchronous loading of these levels. So you can show the progress of that next level load and you can mask the stutter when you switch scenes that you'll see from a lot of other tutorials teaching you how to do this, especially when you're loading larger levels. Hey, Chris here from Lama Academy. Here to help you. Who? Me? Yes, you. Make your game dev dreams become a reality by helping you make a more robust scene transition framework for your game. Most of the tutorials I see on this topic are very beginner friendly, which is great if you only really need those simple transitions. I find that they kind of ignore the fact that if you have larger scenes, you will have a large stutter if you do just the load scene. So I thought I'd try my hand making a more complicated, more robust system to do that scene transitioning. And I'm sorry for my voice. I've had this sickness for like, ever now, so I apologize for that. The high level concept of what we do whenever we're transitioning between scenes comes in really three steps. The first one is we wanna fade out the current scene somehow, usually by obstructing the view of the camera with some kind of UI element. Then once the camera is fully blocked, we'll actually do that swapping of the level so that way the player doesn't just see the world change before their eyes. And then we'll fade in that next scene by having that animation where the UI goes away. Most other tutorials cover this in the exact same way. There's not really a lot of variation in this because that's pretty much the process that you're probably gonna wanna do. In our flow, we're gonna create a new singleton with don't destroy on load. And generally I don't recommend to do this, but it fits this use case perfectly well. We want exactly one of these to ever be present in our entire game, and we want this canvas to be available across scenes. This is like the quintessential use case for having singleton with do not destroy on load. The key to all scene transitionings in Unity is having the scene manager to load a scene, load a scene async, load by build index, there's just a bunch of stuff to load scenes. It also raises an event after scene loading has been completed. That's this active scene changed event. So where does the scriptable object come in? That's where it might be more of an intermediate advanced tutorial because on each scriptable object we're going to define how do we do that transition? So we're doing this in code. You could also do it with an animator. I just am a programmer, so I like to do it in the code. So we'll define concrete implementations of an abstract scriptable object for each different fade mode. Specifically, we're gonna look at two today, one that just fades in and out, and one that has like a circle come in and out. It looks kind of cool. You could do more robust things like show a loading progress bar. You could do things like apply shader effects to that image. You could do multiple different images doing things. There's all kinds of stuff you can do here because you have full control with that scriptable object with a reference to a live mono behavior so we can even run code routines. At a high level, that's what we're gonna do. So let's jump into the editor and start looking at how I've got the scene set up so far. Today we have a scene that's already put together for us. This is an example scene where it's a really small build size because it's like your main menu. We're usually looking for the scene to load very quickly. So like I was talking before, we're gonna have a UI thing that comes over and kind of blocks the camera view. Then we're gonna load the other scene and then fade that thing back out or do whatever animation to have it go back out. And the new scene is displayed for the camera. And that's gonna be managed completely through this scene transitioner script that you see here on the loading overlay. If we load the game scene, we're gonna hop over to the other scene and we're gonna see something totally different. I know it doesn't look quite right when we're doing it in the editor. Anytime that you load scenes in the Unity editor, it's not as smooth as it is in the actual player. For example, if we launch this with the build, it's very smooth. That's all that we're doing here. So these buttons that we see here, they're just using our scene transitioner instance load scene, and it's gonna tell us which scene by scene name we're gonna load, and then what type of transition mode we wanna use. So this transition mode is an enum where we can add as many different transition modes as we wanna implement for our game. You could even add a random one where it'll just choose a random one whenever you're doing the transition. The primary purpose of the scene transitioner is to wrap the scene manager, which is the class that Unity gives us to manage scenes and go between them. We're really only exposing one function here, load scene, which accepts a scene name. I really prefer to use the name of the scene instead of the build index because I move the scene build indexes around all the time. I add new scenes and I want the one then to kind of be in order that they get used. So they just change all the time. The scene name usually doesn't change. We have a scene transition mode and the load scene mode because maybe you don't only want to do it with one active scene at a time 
time, maybe you want to add to the load scenes. Most of the time I see people doing scene manager load scene. That works fine if your scenes are relatively small and can be loaded very quickly. There's a different way to load scenes called load scene async, which allows us to do a lot more of the loading in the background, which makes the transitioning between scenes significantly smoother. The second thing we do is find out which transition we want to use based on the mode. And a transition, by the way, simply has a scene transition mode and a scene transition scriptable object. We're going to look at that in just a second. If we found a transition, then we're going to tell the load level operation, which is what's returned by load scene async, gives us kind of a handle to refer to this thing that's running in the background. And we can tell it that we do not want it to activate the next scene because we want to play this animation first. Since we've already started it, we don't want to get like halfway through, change the scenes, and you can see that the scene changed. We want the animation to play. Then we want to activate the scene. Then we want to play the inverse animation after the next scene has been activated. So we'll enable the transition canvas, set the active transition to be this animation scriptable object so that we can play the inverse inverse animation to get rid of whatever we just put in front of the camera. And we'll start a coroutine to exit. If you look at that coroutine to exit, you can see that we're actually going to wait for another coroutine to finish before we do anything. So yield return and then start coroutine. We'll wait for that other coroutine to completely finish before we hit the next line. And all we're doing here is active transition.exit, passing in the transition canvas that just plays the animation. Again, we're going to look at where that's implemented in just a second. But once that animation is played to actually block the camera, then we want to say, hey, load level operation, you can go ahead and activate yourself now, which if it's done loading by this point will happen on that next frame. We'll activate the other scene, but then how do you call this enter coroutine where we're going to do the inverse of exit, disable the canvas, and reset kind of the state of this scene transitioner? An excellent question. If we take a look at awake, we'll see this line here on line 33, scene manager active scene changed. This is an event that's raised by the scene manager after a new scene has been fully activated. We've assigned that to be handle scene change, where we check if the active transition is not null because maybe we didn't define a transition and we just wanted it to happen. So if it's not null, then we'll start the coroutine to enter, which is going to enter in the next scene, which will remove the UI element from the screen. That's all that we're doing in the scene transitioner, but the scene transitioner gives us a way, a very similar way to how the scene manager works, to just call load scene whenever you want to change the scene. So the way that you do it's very similar. You're just telling it which type of transition mode you want whenever you're going to transition the scenes. From here, the next important component we look at is that abstract scene transition scriptable object. Now an abstract class cannot be instantiated, meaning we cannot add that create asset menu to this scriptable object. It'll give us an error whenever we try to do that. And here we're going to define all of the common things that every single transition needs to do. It needs to have an animation time. What we're doing today, it needs an image that's going to animate. I'm assuming for our purposes today, it's going to be an image that covers the canvas. You can make this anything you want it to be. I feel like for most cases, this is what we're looking for. So we've got those two. It also defines that any concrete implementation of this class must implement the I enumerator enter and exit. Lastly, it also gives us a way to create that image because you'll remember that that canvas didn't have any child. So we have two concrete implementations of this scriptable object in the repository today. The one we've already looked at is called circle transition scriptable object. Where we've added that create asset menu, file name, circle, menu name, scene transitions, circle. We defined two new variables here. So it has everything that was on the abstract scene transition scriptable object and the circle sprite that we want to use and the color we want it to be. When we're having a scene exit, we're going to create that new image. We're going to set the color, set the size delta to be zero, assign the sprite, and then calculate how big the maximum size should be. And that's this screen width squared plus screen height squared, and then take the square root of that. That ensures that the circle, as long as you don't have padding on it, will fully cover any device's screen. So we'll set the target size to be that size and then just lerp up to that size. You could also define animation curves here if you wanted to make it not just a simple lerp. You could have like more bouncy effects with an animation curve instead of just lerp. Once that's done, we'll actually wait there until the next level has loaded so the screen will be completely blocked. Then remember that the scene manager active scene change callback is going to get called and then we're going to start the coroutine to enter, meaning enter the new scene. And we're going to do just the inverse of what we just did. We're going to do the same size calculation and set the initial size to be that size and then lerp from the initial size back down to zero. At the end, we destroy that animated object game object because we created it and we don't want it to be residually there. If we open up the fade transition scriptable object, you'll see it's almost the exact same thing, but instead we're going to make it just go from totally transparent to fully black, wait for the scene to load, then go from fully black to transparent. That's the same pattern you can apply for any type of transition. You can do literally anything here. 
And don't forget the Unity Asset Store Black Friday sale is going on right now. If you're watching this when this first comes out, it's a bunch of assets on sale up to 70% off. So head over there, check it out, see if any of those assets will add value to your game. We've got an affiliate link in the description and a card on the screen. One important thing, at least on Windows, if you press Control Shift B, it takes you to the build settings. Make sure you've added all the scenes that you need to load, otherwise this won't work at all. If you have an open scene currently, you can click add open scenes. If you have any scenes just in a folder, you can just drag them here and they'll show up as included in the build. What I've done that you might want to do a little bit differently in your actual game is put in here our loading overlay. What you might want to do differently is have this canvas on its own scene so it only gets loaded one time throughout the entire lifetime of your game. Right now when we switch between scenes we keep destroying the one that's loaded on every subsequent run back to the main menu. So I guess the last thing to talk about is how do you make a new scene transition? In the scene transitioner, you can click plus, it'll add you a new one, and you can have one per circle, add a circle transition scriptable object. You have multiple different ones and choose random ones, for example. All of these show up also under scene transitions, circle fade, because of how we define that create asset menu. Keep this video at a reasonable length. I've only implemented a couple of different variations of the transition. But remember, you can do literally anything here. You could, instead of having it all defined with code, you could use an animator instead. You can apply shader effects. You could spawn a bunch of different objects and play particle systems, literally anything. I mean, use two simple examples here, but use your imagination and come up with all kinds of cool stuff. Remember that this was more of an intermediate or advanced type of tutorial. If your game is really small and all of your scenes are very small, probably what you see in other tutorials about how to do this will work just fine. This is more if you have like larger scenes or a bunch of scenes and you want to have cool customizable transitions in between each of those scenes. This is a framework for you to implement a wide variety of different transitions. So if you're really only looking for one scene transition, this might be overkill for your project. But if you got value out of this video, go ahead and like and subscribe to help the channel grow, reach more people and add value to more people. There's new videos posted every tutorial Tuesday. And if you want to support this channel, you can go to patreon.com slash Academy, get your name up here on the screen and get a voice shout out. So I got the awesome tier. Speaking of those awesome supporters, there's Gerald Anderson, Autumn K, Matt Parkin, Ivan and Rulin. And at the phenomenal tier, there's Andrew Bowen and Andrew Albright. Thank you all for your support. I'm incredibly grateful.